you know, I'm a really big believer in, in manifestation in the way that I believe it, which is vi visualization and action. Some people just visualize and they think it's going to show up. That's just never worked for me. I wish it did. I visualize like, you know, a couple of beach houses and a townhouse in New York. Kimberly, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I've listened to like several of these and I was I was getting jealous. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so you're you're it's kind of hard to define what you do, but you're I know you're a coach, you're a consultant, you're a community leader. Is there anything else you'd like listeners that aren't familiar with you to know about you? Yeah, I mean I am I do live between two worlds, right? So when it comes to people, I I run and manage like groups of communities in the in the tens of thousands, Facebook groups and and circle. Um and I'm and I have I've monetized those. But those came from, you know, years of building connections with people. And so I kept those in the world of uh integrative 360 approach coaching, which is, you know, full mind, body, spirit, financial, all of it. And then um, I live a very yin yang type of universe. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the other side, I am very pragmatic, very analytical. I love data. I own a company called New Natives, but I also, um, I'm a consultant for tech and startups. So I sort of split my day between, you know, manifestation meditation and then technology. And, um, on the coaching side, I can, I coach any, anyone, you know, from CEOs, NBA, NFL players, uh, teachers, um, content creators a lot uh, as well. And then on the other side, like I said, startups, um, anyone looking to really figure out what's going on with their business. I'm kind of called the problem solver. Either it's like MacGyver, if you're from that age, Olivia Pope, if you're from that, or um, Wendy, if you're from Bill, if you've watched Billions. So different people give me different nicknames, but um, I like the balance of both. I think that it keeps the brain the brain sharp. So I get that spirituality with coaching, being able to heal others heals me, and then the innovative, you know, future side with the uh, startups and uh, consulting of technology. And then, of course, I, I still write um, books in my downtime. Um, I just don't always publish them for everybody else and do it for myself. Um, yeah. But I am looking to get those out. But the biggest thing that I would say, so I wanted to get that out of the way so that we don't have to go deep into that. But being a mom of a 20 and a 21 year old is probably the best thing that has ever happened to me. And you hear that from a lot of moms, but with someone who has three chronic illnesses that, you know, lap over each other and have been through a lot of traumas in life, um, a lot of tragedy. My next book is called Tragic Magic for a Reason. Um, those those two kids, I call them my babies, Jade and Lou, um, they're the reason that I'm here. So I consider yeah. that job to be forever. There's yeah. no like, oh, they're 18. So that that's what I want people to know the most about me is that, you know, at the end of my days, and when that comes, what was I, what was I most proud of being Jade and Lou's mom? Hmm. So. How do you do so much? Like you have so much going on. Like when you say what you do, it almost sounds like you're talking about a career, like a 10 year, 20 year span of everything you do, but you're all, you're doing all of that right now. Like, how do you end up there? Is it like, was that planned? 20 years ago, did you know you'd end up around here or like, how did you end up doing everything you're doing right now? You know, no, I, um, I graduated high school and I had always been very academically, um, driven and did a lot of great things in that and got scholarships. I met my husband, my kid's dad, my ex-husband when I was 17 and I converted to, uh, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, no longer a member. Um, no shade, just not where I, I landed, but I, um, moved out to, uh, Utah and was going to school, actually wanted to be a defense attorney. One summer tried to do that as an intern and said, no way that was mm. not for me. And yeah. so I adjusted and got a full ride scholarship for journalism. The, my last year of high school, the journalism teacher had heard that, um, I wrote poems and, 
uh, stories and um, wanted to, you know, talk to me about that. And I wrote a lot for the school newspaper. And in that one year, that pointed me toward journalism. And I'd always loved journalism. So, you know, I did that. And then we got married, had my first son at the age of 22, married mm-hmm. at 21, bought a house. Um, 22, had my son. Three months after he's born, I get pregnant with my daughter. So I have another child at 22 within a year. Um, I'm autistic on the spectrum, diagnosed at age six. So throughout my life, I didn't really know where I would land because I just, I couldn't imagine like putting an, a name on anything. I didn't know where I would go. So the way that I've always been is sort of a free spirit that's structured, yeah. which is strange. Mm. And that's why I said I live a very yin yang, dark light universe, uh, tragic magic life because I am very structured. But I have this ability to just say, you know what, we're going to, we're just going to go with whatever comes. So intuition plays a big part in that. Every step of each stage and every age. So every age has dictated that I, you know, move into a different stage. And I've always thought about it because they rhyme. So each age, big age, 21, 25, 30, 35, 40, each big age has really required a new stage. And so I take that seriously and I sort of Phoenix process every time that happens and staying open to the yeses, you know, can you do this? Yes. You know, I'll figure it out has led me down some really interesting paths. So what I believe is when people say Kimberly's lived a thousand lives, they're not too far off, you know, more like 20. But what I've done is I have taken the best parts of all of those being a mama, being a wife being a crafter for Martha Stewart, you know, being, um, someone who lived in the South and uh, someone who was a singer and wrote songs for her, um, choirs in her area, music deals, all kinds of things. I took those things and everything that I could pull, pull from those things that I learned, I decided to put into something and it landed me in coaching and consulting. So it sounds crazy, but I am organized and I delegate. So that's how you can use much more of your life. If you really master the art of delegation and you master the art of structure and really creating your own lane and your own bubble, as some of my clients, uh, Emaz from Spaces would like to say, you know, Kimberly creates her own bubble and it's, it's true. So just making sure that, you know, I do what I love to do. And as long as I love to do it, then I'm more likely to find creative ways to allow myself to maximize my time, still see my children, be with my partner and practice self-care. Is it a perfect art? Of course not. Is it a perfect science? Of course not. But I get to do a lot more and I don't have to choose. I don't have to say I have to choose coaching over this. Um, I get to really move into different lanes depending on different seasons. Yeah. And I think each season has a different reason. So if it's this season is a lot of startups, then I'm more that direction. Example, yeah. Elon uh, left. Uh, sorry, Elon came and a lot of people left X. I built a lot of relationships with some of the people that worked at X. And I got to do two startups with people that had started their own startups. So for that season, I was off of spaces, uh, X spaces on X. And, um, after being there for three years, I took a break and did the startups. And then when those were done and we were bought out, I moved back on the spaces because that season had a new reason. And that was to connect and to coach and to build community and teach how to build community the right way, the longevity way. So long story long, that, that would be how I do it. With the with the tech companies, the startups that you built, is that how you started getting into consulting for tech is after those startups? Yeah, so this is why I call it tragic magic and you have to stay open. You know, I'm a really big believer in in manifestation in the way that I believe it, which is the visualization and action. Some people just visualize and they think it's gonna show up. That's just never worked for me. I wish it did. I'd visualize like, you know couple of beach houses and a townhouse in New York. But for me, uh, being open, like I said, 
intuitively knowing when the next phase of life should be coming is yeah. that's been huge. So for me, my first consulting job to bring this all full circle, full circle to where I am now, 2013, I had gone through a, a divorce from someone famous, moved to Seattle, went off the grid, did not know how to get a job. I didn't even have a car at that time and really felt like I'd gone behind in life backwards almost. And yeah. there was a big lesson in that because I would, to some people looking at it, I would have gone backwards in their minds. But for me, I was able to fixate on my children, really pay attention to them, be a great mom to them. And I get to say that because that's what they've called me. And they're 20 and 21 now, but we slept in the same room. We shared a bed for a long time and we hopped on buses to get them to school. And I felt like I needed to quit a job once uh, out of some inappropriate behavior with my boss. So I just quit the job, not knowing, you know, I, it was the craziest thing. Like I don't have a job and it's Seattle, but it was summer. Kids were going with their dad. I didn't have a lease. So, um, my friend said, I work for a photography company and she's old school and she's losing money because she doesn't have social media, which mm. I started social media and my agency of social media in 2010. 2009 actually. And she said, we could use you. And I said, let's, let's talk about it. She didn't do computers. So she asked me, would you like to come out to San Diego and California? And I'd been like the whole winter in Seattle and, uh, consult for me for three months and this salary, the most I'd ever made. And I was like, Oh my goodness. And you can, you know, I was like, well, where would I stay? And she's like, Oh, you can just borrow one of the beach houses. Like, how is that real? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, but you have to believe that magic like that exists. So I said, yes, not knowing if I could pull it off because I hadn't done consulting before, but I, I believed enough in myself and I wanted something better for my kids and myself. And we'd been through enough. So moved to San Diego for that summer, La Jolla. And that is when the consulting started on a bigger level. And I remember being here and I was like, I will be back there in the, but before 10 years, I will have moved back to California or moved to California and I will be a resident. And here I am on Hancock street in Midtown in San Diego. And I've been a resident for two years and I don't want to cry. So I'm not going to. And, um, you know, I made my dream a reality, um, because I just, I wasn't going to say no when it was clear that God co-creator source, whatever you believe had put these things right in front of me. And, uh, there was no way that I was going to let that go. That's, that's really cool. I, and oh, I love and tech, San Diego. Yeah, yeah. With tech, it was because I'm, uh, on the spectrum and have savant syndrome in some areas that I won't go into, but the pattern reading. So mm. when I worked with Facebook, if you've ever done one of those quizzes that tell you what your spirit animal is or your, your rose, it takes a bunch of info words that you post on your your page and it comes up with a recommendation that you're likely to be the color red or you're yeah. likely to identify as a butterfly or a bird. And so I worked on that software because I had already been doing that myself with my branding clients. And yeah. so we worked on that and the patterns is how I got into the startup world. Nice. Um, you, First of all, San Diego is awesome. I think that's a good place to be. Um, it's expensive. So if you can make it work, it's amazing. Um, I was there for a summer one time, but with, you mentioned delegation and I find this interesting because as a fairly new entrepreneur, it's something that I'm racking my brain around, uh, over constantly. Do you feel like people wait too long to start delegating tasks when they start a business usually? Yes and no. I think it can go both ways. I think that definitely some people wait. They want to wait to see if they can do it. So yeah. there's a lot of like two year old mindset in a, in a 30 year old body. No, no, I, I can do it. I can do it. We yeah. all can do it, right? We can post to social media. We can figure it out. We can watch YouTube. We could teach ourselves a lot of things. I was a photographer for, um, you know, professional for 10 years. I taught myself Photoshop and to code my website, but I had to because I didn't have the money to do it. However, when I moved into a place of having 
money to put back in my business. That's where I find is the difference. Some mm-hmm. people want the money. They want to buy, you know, like I said, I slept in the same bedroom with my children forever. I also shared a one bedroom that we turned into a studio and a one bedroom with my partner, Sinjin, that I've been with so that we could save to move to California. We actually haven't found it to be expensive for us because of the lifestyle we lead. And so um, for us, we are more natural. We go out and we do things. Same thing with my business. The things that I prioritized was putting money back into my business. So a good example would be the group that I have on Facebook. We have a free group, 40,000 women. And I said, we've done a lot of great things. I'll keep this one open. If you would like to enter the paid one, it's a dollar per month. And then you get access to exclusive content and first come first, you know, first come um, basis for uh, any courses that I put out for 30 days. Mm -hmm. And what happened with that is, you know, like 16,000 women started first and then 18,000 women. So you're already bringing in about 18,000 a month. Most people would just be like, I'm going to keep all the money and I'm just going to try to run it myself. But I had run a group by myself for long enough. And what I decided was hiring two uh, virtual assistant admins that had been in my in that group for years, understood it, knew the tone of my world, knew the community well, knew what I try I was trying to achieve. Um, hired both of them for two thousand each, so mm. four thousand goes out the door out of yeah. that eighteen thousand. And some people go fourteen thousand to to you know these women. Absolutely, best decision ever. On the other side, some people go, I don't want to deal with that. I'm going to get an editor and I'm going to, you know, like YouTube, I'm going to get an editor immediately. And they just go through all of this photography. They go buy all of this equipment and they don't give themselves time to catch up to that. They can't because they're mm-hmm. they're They don't have another job or they don't have another source of income. And so what happens is it, you know, they've delegated too fast when they really could have gotten away with a, a lower level of editing for a little bit, because most people don't really care so much about the editing on a lot of things until you get up to a big level. Yeah. And so delegating too soon can cost you a lot of money that you could have used for other things or even to get by. As content creators, entrepreneurs, we have to be of sound mind and you have to have a good foundation. And one of the ways that you do that is with financial security. So you can create at the top level of where you're at if you know that your bills are being paid, but some people will stretch it to delegate and then they are not operating at their highest self because they're worried about money. So I think it can go different ways, but uh, definitely at some point, most people are going to have to grapple with letting go of control and trusting that people can pull off things the same way that you can, if not better. I've learned that so many women that I hire can do things 10 times faster and better than I can, especially Gen Z. My kids have worked for me. They can knock out social media posts in five minutes. They can do five in the time it takes me to do one at times. So just knowing that you've got to put your ego to the side as well and know that people can do a good job. Yeah, a lot of people knocked Gen Z too for like work ethic. And a lot of people knocked millennials too for work ethic too. But it it's interesting to hear you say that because I agree. I think I think every generation and granted generations are arbitrary, but they're all good at different things, you know. Mm-hmm. So, like you said, Gen Z is going to be great at social media, and they have their own creative aspects too for their generation. So, it's interesting mm. to hear that. More than inspired by my children, mm. they know how to do social media but they, they're not, they're not interested in it. That's one of the craziest things is people think that Gen Z is just sitting on their phone all day. A lot of them actually don't engage in a lot of it. Millennials do. And some of the Gen Z, the Gen Alpha, but Gen Z itself, there's a lot of people that are just, my kids were like, eh, like we worked in it. We helped mom since we were 15 or 16. So we saw what it did to people. And for them, they're just not interested. My daughter, you know, just came back from a a lake trip um, that she flew to with her friends. My son goes roller skating Hmm. and they they go out to the beach. And that's why I said it's not expensive for us because we do a lot of natural things. 
And I think that's why picking where you live is important because if you are the type of person that surfs, um, roller skates is out, wants to be around people, you're going to spend less money going out to party or dance or, you know, go drink with your friends because you're going to be, you know, in a space where you're doing things that are natural and free. You're also going to spend less money on gas. When we lived in Texas, for example, we would have to spend like $35 to get across the city in traffic and do all of that. And there, and the air conditioning and all of this stuff where, where we live in Midtown, we walk or ride a bike. Everything's within five minutes. It's a walkable, walkable city where we are. So it just depends on figuring out what you want your end goal to be and really visualizing that. And then knowing that it's not going to happen immediately, but you can work up to that. And the same goes for delegation. You can put that on sort of like, mm, you know, your work ethic to say, yeah. I'm going to learn this on my own. Um, but as far, and, and then I'll delegate it later. As far as Gen Z and millennials, millennials are very innovative because they wanted to do things faster. Gen Z has a whole different world where they're almost taking on old values. So if you see Gen Z groups and you're like, well, the Gen Z's I know are not, I, I see, I, I can understand that. But a lot of what I've seen with Gen Z generation and a lot of the friends around my children have these like older values where they're like, you know, we're going to go to go to college or we're going to start our own businesses, but we're going to slow down and take our time dating. And um, they don't, you know, sleep around a lot. Um, they they don't go in my, like my kids and the groups of friends that they have. They don't drink and do a lot of crazy stuff. Um, there's caveats to that. But I think that we should we should slow down and look at each generation a little bit less judgy and just kind of yeah. like step back and see what, what each generation brings to the table and then maybe where they lack. And then we will find the best way to collaborate. The best thing that you could do, like I'm Gen X, I'm Millennial, the last Gen X and Millennial, I'm on that year that's called Zennial. Yeah. The best thing that you could do in life is to collaborate with all levels, people that have been in business for 50 years, get them to mentor you. And then your uh, Gen X, who's just kind of like floating out. We don't know. Like I consider myself Gen X sometimes. We don't even know what's going on some days. We're like, we're just here watching other uh, everybody else do stuff. Um, get a Gen Xer that helps you not take life so intensely all the time. They know the patience. Millennials, allow them to help you understand how to do things faster and more efficiently because they were the generation of, we don't, we, we want to be digital nomads. We want to work and travel mm. and like stay at home. And then with Gen Z, allow them to show you that as soon as the quick, the quicker you learn something that seems hard, like the better your life will, will be mixed with, it's okay for you to go back to that tradition of enjoying nature and getting out and enjoying community because Gen Z is really, really, I think, a great example of community where millennial, Gen X, and boomers tend to be alone because social of social media. They, we tend to isolate. The older groups tend to isolate a, a bit more. But what I've seen with Gen Z is they're coming together and going to these parades and you know uh, music festivals, not the crazy ones, the fun ones, and coming together as communities and having you know um, picnics at the park and bonfires and different things like that. So yeah. um, again, caveats to everything, but I think if you look at things through the lens of how people in communities can play their role, you're going to get a lot more out of that community rather than if you're looking at everybody through a lens of they're already at a disadvantage because of stereotypes. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. When it comes to the Facebook group that you built, do you think uh, Facebook groups are something that people can still build successfully today? Or do you think that was, because Facebook has changed over the last, I think Facebook started around 2003 and it's changed a lot since then. Like at first it was, a lot of young people on there. It was only introduced to college people. And then, then the grandmothers and the mothers, you know, the grandparents, grandfathers, all that, all the older generations started going on. So the dynamic of Facebook changed a lot. And it seems like it's not as popular among younger generations now. Do you exactly. feel like, 
people can still start Facebook groups like that now, or has that time kind of passed? You can start Facebook groups if you're older Hmm. because the demographic is there. And then if you want to start communities, I would recommend like I I have a circle community. Um, The younger ones tend to be on discord school, you know, things like that. So just finding where it seems like your age group and your base is. So absolutely people, um, I coach people all the time on how the exact template that I use for my uh, Facebook, I've given it free on Twitter X spaces on IG on Facebook. I've literally given that, that platform that, you know, it for free. I've coached women on how to build and men on how to build their Facebook group and charge for it later. Still do that. Um, and, uh, my agency also coaches and consults and builds people's circle community from them for start to finish. So depending on the age group, when you identify that, then you can decide where you're probably likely to land. Discord is one of those for the younger groups where they understand and they talk more and there's games and, you know, uh, video games and then, um, circle professionals, mighty networks, a lot of community built there. Facebook groups are a little bit different because you're building off of people that are like your family and friends and once removed, not strangers like X or something like that. So absolutely, you can still do that. I've got a woman who's 63. Um, Her testimonials on my website uh, that we're relaunching next week. And uh, she came to me just wanting to do a refurb, like a Instagram that was for refurbishing um, products like, um, chairs and tables. And now she has a paid Facebook group for people who want to learn the techniques for that. And so she goes live and she asks, she answers questions. And she also posts videos privately to that group. And like I said, she's like 63 or 64 about my mom's age, but the people that she's connected with on her Facebook are around that age. They're not on TikTok. They're not on X. They're not on um, what do you call it? A uh, circle. They don't know any of those. Yeah. So absolutely. You could still do that. Um, and that's why finding somebody that understands all of the communities is important depending on your age and your niche. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook communities always seemed a little different to me for the reason that you said you're, you're going within your network and these are usually people that you know, like Facebook is that's who you connect with on Facebook is people you usually meet in real life. Um, not just posting and growing like on other platforms. So it's just interesting how that works out. So that's how you grow a community on Facebook is it's a, it's through your friends and then they're inviting people and then it's like that. That's one way. Um, there's other strategies that happen. So as in this case, the woman has a website. Yeah. And she sells mini classes on how to refurbish something. And as an, and, and this is what I coach with my clients is the strategy of, you know, the art form of the add ons and the scaling up and the bonuses and the, the additions. So she sells these little mini courses on what she does both online and in person. And as an add on, she's like, join this Facebook group and it's free. So you join that one and every time she goes to sell something, she can post it in there. And then she did what I did. You know, she built it up over a year and then she said, I'm going to level up. I'm going to start adding exclusive content. So if anybody would like to join me, it's, you know, $10 a month, a dollar a month, whatever you want to do. And I'm going to start another group. So you can do it as an add on to your course or your offer or you can sell it on its own. You can say, we're going to start this group and this is what you're going to get from me every Friday. I'm going to hold office hours. I'll be teaching this because Facebook allows a lot of cool things. And I, I've worked with, you know, the X spaces group over at X, um, the communities, and they don't, they don't have a lot in the same regards as the other platforms yet. But at Facebook, there's files that you can put rules, worksheets, anything there. You can store videos, anything that you want there. You can go live in the group, which is great. So it's not public, it's live and people can ask questions. You can have a secret group. You can have a public group. 
lots of different things that you can do with Facebook. And then I see a lot of coaches on Facebook doing that. They utilize that. A lot of coaches that are teaching things um, and that becomes their network. And then also on Mighty Networks, a lot of entrepreneurs on uh, creator, like um, on community, uh, cir- like um, platforms like Circle. Mm. And then, like we said before, the sort of like edgy younger crowd gets on Discord where they they know so naturally where to go and what to do. And you yeah. can monetize that, you know, nine ninety nine a month. You can have private calls over there and video chats. So many different options that fit people. And I would just always recommend people to do their research for what would make sense for them and what they feel that they could understand. You gotta, you have to feel comfortable. Like yeah. I'm sure you, you think of this uh, already is it, it's, it's already right. That's how you say yeah. it. Yeah. So I see this cute little bed, uh, sorry, background at bed. Um, this, sorry, this background that you have with the, the tree and the lighting, um, People have to be comfortable where they create and you've got your setup, you've got your microphone and these, you know, pretty photos and the, is that a salt lamp or a lava lamp? Yeah. Lava lamp, yeah, lava lamp. and the, the tree, uh, the, uh, my, uh, hanging you got there and that ambient lighting. So when you go to sit down to create, you're going to feel proud and you're going to feel comfortable with creating in that space. I would like people to think of communities and the things that they do the same way. If you go onto a platform, like I don't like discord, it's, it's got different colors and it's janky to me in my mind. I'm like, it's like, that's for like video gamers and my kids. Um, yeah. even though I'm a part of discord for people that I subscribe to, but I don't like the layout of it. So I wouldn't want to teach there, but circle allows me to teach have live spaces, have people come in to interview them. I can put a course together. That's module. And in that I can do a course that is a welcome video. Then I can do a live the next week. And then I've got another video. I can do some worksheets. You know, it's just phenomenal that each of these school does something similar, that each of these cater to different things. So what I like to say is go take the trial and familiarize yourself like you're test driving a car or sitting in a home that you want to rent or buy. And whatever feels like home is going to be the best place for you because you will feel inspired to create there. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you, what makes a good community? Like, so once you start a community, what makes a community valuable for the people in it? What makes a good community leader? What makes a community really thrive? Yeah. I mean, there's so many factors and I'll, I'll just try to narrow them down. First and foremost, the community leader leading by example, setting the tonality of it, setting the vibe of how it feels is going to be important. Second, that support staff that I talked about, the admin, the moderators that are going to make sure it's a safe, inclusive, well-run structured space. Um, even if your space is wild and off, you know, off the chain, you still have some structure to the chaos, but the rest of the community is going to be made up of people that are like-minded. You're not in there arguing. And I mean, like-minded as in like, you can have different opinions, but you're not fighting. So debating is different than fighting, offering different perspectives um, is not fighting, but I think the most, you know, successful communities are the ones that do not become stagnant. So you have to start growing and evolving with the trends of the world while riding a fine line of keeping the same vibe and vision that you started with. So one of the reasons that I don't keep my world together, X group and community is separate than my Facebook group is because They're just not the same people. They're not the same vibe. And I also promised, you know, when everybody kept saying, we're going to get too big. And then, you know, what's the use of everybody having these courses that you have? So I promised people that I would cap it at 40,000. When I got to 40,000, oh, it was like, do I want to do that? Because there were more people wanting in. But that was one of the single best decisions that I made 
because that one decision alone, when people knew that I could offer, I could have more people in and I could, I could probably get paid more down the road because I do sponsorships through there as well. People really, that built a lot of trust that probably gained me trust three years faster, five years faster because I capped it and I didn't allow, it was a free group. I didn't allow people in after that. And it's also benefited me because it reigns me in. It allowed like structure allows you to be accountable because I said that I wouldn't allow anybody in when I wanted to bring people from X over into that group. I could have done that, but I would have, you know, ruined my trust. And also as X happened, there was some interesting things that, that went on on X. And I just was like, I'm very, very happy that no matter what happens here, this world over here has not been touched. Hmm. And that got resolved and it was fine. And I started a different community with those ex members on Circle. But I think making sure that you understand that you owe accountability to the people as a leader and then making sure that people respect what your vision and your mission is having a clear mission and a clear vision for what you want to achieve and what you want to offer. And I would say last but not least encouraging. Some people are all about them, you know, like I think somebody said it. Um, I don't even remember the joke now, but it doesn't matter. It's all about me, me, me and being the guru. I think that we are, completely overdue to retire gurus. That word should probably be gone. You know, we're all still learning. We're all in different places. So put the guru out and listen to your group, pay attention and let them see you making changes. Let them see the value. Um, but the other thing about it is making sure that it feels like you are in the group and a lot of other people, they'll start groups. And the reason they fail is because what happens is it's all about them. As in like, they're the, the big, you know, I'm, I'm the famous person and people just go, I'm not really getting value out of this because you're building it for you. And so just making sure that you're fortifying, cultivating, nurturing all the talent that is in that community, letting mm. people play their roles, the nurturer, letting people play the roles of holding space. Other people are going to teach. Other people are going to um, bring in resources. Other people are going to, you know, uh, help out when it comes to conflict. So allowing everybody to have their place so that they feel needed. And then also the support prayer request or good vibes or, you know, I'm going for this new job. Oh my gosh, let's all like do an eight minute meditation together. And one of the things I do in my community, having little n nuanced, unique things that, you know, bring people back is keeping it fresh, not stagnant. So recently I offered, we're going to do eight minute meditation circles. And that means every Thursday at this time, 8 PM, um, I'm going to, you know, early in the day, I'm going to drop a thread and I'm going to say, write your name underneath if, or put an emoji. If you want to be included in the group meditation tonight, and then we get on live and whoever is in that um, thread, we meditate that whatever they're trying to achieve in life, as long as it's for the greatest of all good, you're not trying to manifest your neighbor's husband. Um, right. As long as it's the greatest of all good, you're meditating for everybody included. So you don't have to do it individually for like thousands of women you can drop it underneath and be creative with the value that you're giving. And you'd be surprised at how many women look forward in my group to those Thursday meditation sessions because the world got so crazy over the week and they got, it got away from them and they didn't meditate and they didn't do self care. And they, and they'd forgotten to pray. And you know, that was how they got back to themselves. That was how they, they, they sat down for that eight minutes. And there's something powerful when you're on a phone even more in person. I do them in person, but something powerful when all of you are praying for the entire community to lift and the vibration for everybody to lift. So mm -hmm. just finding new ways to keep it fresh, 
and to add more value. And if that means rotating out some things that aren't working and adding new things, that that works too. Uh, early, you mentioned three chronic illnesses you have. I know, uh, so I, I'd imagine you're talking autism, uh, Lyme disease, and what it, what is the third, if you don't mind me asking? So no, autism wouldn't, I wouldn't consider autism a, one of my diseases. Okay. That's a learning disability kind of vibe. Okay. D- d- different people classify it differently. So maybe some would. I don't look at mine like that because it, I just, I feel it's actually really benefited certain parts of mm-hmm. my life. Um, so I have Lyme disease that I got at 12, you know, living in the mountains and living in Mississippi and, uh, going up to Arkansas in the mountains, you're going to get bit by ticks and it happened a lot. So got Lyme disease at 12 and it, it kind of stays in the body. So it comes in and out of remission and it can cause other problems. And that one led to lupus because mm-hmm. it went unchecked and that led to lupus lupus. I also have the the version. I don't like to get too deep into this just for time's sake, but remission, yeah. uh, I can, I live, I have the remission version of lupus. So I can always be in remission of chronic disease. I still say I have them because they're dormant in my system, but at any time, one or three of them can come out and kind of cause havoc. But the last one is Addison's, which is the adrenals that sit on top of your kidneys. They regulate the oh, fight or okay. flight hormone. I grew up with a lot of stress and a lot of trauma and PTSD and that really did a number on those. Lyme disease also causes a lot of issues with that. Lupus also causes a lot of issues. So they kind of overlap and cause like, they're just like menaces to each other. So yeah. I got my license in Ayurvedic and uh, herbology. And um, that's where the integrative part comes of my coaching. So I got my license in integrative health and nutrition and naturopathic studies. So I am able to keep myself alive and in my bubble and do a lot more than some of the people that have what I have because I make my own smoothies. I make my own like little antibiotic, funny antibiotic drinks and, um, you know, making sure that I use herbs as well as Western medicine, the combo, that hybrid of Western medicine knowledge mixed with Ayurvedic living, which is infusing joy into every part of life. That is how I take care of those. Um, and I think, I think that's pretty much it. I've had cancer twice, mm. um, three times ish. If you counted one situation, um, that they got before. So we'll just say two times, um, but fully. And, um, for me, this is all I know because I was 12 when I first got ill and I'm 30, I'm sorry, I'm 43. So 30 years, really. I, I don't remember anything else. And when I go into remission, it's like, woo, okay. Like this is, this is fun, but I don't grieve going into the sick parts anymore. Like I've lost something because strangely, the number one book, the things that I've done, the big things that I've done have actually been in the sick times of life. Like I just Mm -hmm. went through a brain infection this last weekend, had to go to Texas, get treatment. And now I'm back here with you on the pod, this podcast. So I've always had this tragic to magic right before something big was going to happen. I've always had something crazy. And that's why I love the uh, war of art by Steven Pressfield, because he talks about resistance in there. And I think it's one of the most comprehensive and very easy to digest forms of resistance and how it shows up in your life to stop you from leading the life you're meant to. So I just kind of lean into it. Hopefully it wasn't offensive when I said autism was one of the illnesses. Oh, no. I didn't, I, it makes sense that it's more of a disability than an illness. Um, and I even disability. When, uh, I love when like mistakes happen because mm. it gives people the opportunity to explain it. Cause if yeah. you would have, if you wouldn't have known it, I wouldn't have been able to explain it. And maybe somebody else needs to know that. So I don't look yeah. at mis- like things like that as bad. I'm like, they're actually mistakes that lead to, the education of a lot of people. So it's just a way that you, just the perspective you put on it. Well, yeah, and and autism can be so varied from one person to another that there's like, there seems to be, not to, maybe debate is the word, but uh, people frame it differently for what they have. Some people say, oh, it's more of a superpower for me. But then some people will say, well, it's not a superpower for everyone. It's a spectrum, like, 
Some people it's more of a disability. Some people it might be more beneficial. So yeah, there's a wide range of the ways yeah. it manifests for people. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you said that. Um, I don't, I don't think we get to police how other people experience anything, mental health, yeah. physical health, um, learning disabilities. We get to talk about our experience and that's it. We might get to speak about other people that are inspiring and tell their story as an inspiration, but we don't get to tell people how they should believe or think about their experience. So I, I love that you, you, you brought that up. It's definitely a spectrum. Uh, you know, my son's on it. My daughter's neurodivergent with uh, ADHD, my partner as well. And we can definitely see the differences in what autism does in our home and what ADHD does. And, you know, my mom's brother is nonverbal and mm. then her uncles are also nonverbal. And my mother's, she's on a spectrum of sorts, kind of a mix of ADHD and autism. And you can see that. So I, I think there's just, there's no way to really categorize it down to one thing. So whatever yeah. people tell me is the way that I look at it and I respect it for them. Yeah, that makes sense. I am curious, um, and you kind of touched on this. You get a lot done. You're, you have a very busy life. You have a lot going on and you have three chronic illnesses. How does that work? Like you're, you're doing more than. Uh, a seemingly healthy person might get done. And it it's always kind of interesting. Um, I've talked to other people who have the same kind of thing where they have something that should limit what they do and they seem to achieve more. Do you have a, like an explanation for why that might be? Yeah, I think when mortality and our expiration date, like I say this all the time, we started dying the moment we were born mm. and we seem to forget that maybe we fear death and we don't talk about it. I don't have a problem talking about it. I think it would be healthier if we did the mm. way that I look at it is like, you know, there's a, a use by date on food sometimes. And if you leave that out, that use by date doesn't actually mean anything. If you leave chicken out, used by is actually spoiled because it expired and you can't use it anymore because you left it out instead of refrigerated it. So we don't actually know what our expiration date is, is what I like to call it. And for me, our, my expiration date became really real when I came close to not being here. So I think some people have the ability, they, they can afford to waste time, to procrastinate, to fear failure. But some of us, we don't have the luxury of that. And I, yeah. I really would call it a luxury, you know, barring mental health and barring depression and anxiety or something like that. I don't, I don't want, you know, people to think that I think everybody can just get up and do things. I struggle. I'm not, also not as busy as one would think because of the delegation. So that's another area. I also have, um, you know, I'm always looking for ways to make it easier on myself. Like I said, I create that little bubble. Uh, my co-founder of my business, Emaz, who was a, a just a, somebody who was online, asked me a question one day and became a client and then turned into a co-founder of my business. He's an engineer, an engineer and some other things. And he started building a, a platform called Fusion. And, you know, it's a way to help coaches minimize their time and get more effectively out of AI in different ways and to connect using the system that I have for my coaching. So I'm always looking for ways to minimize time and maximize time with my family and my friends and my children. I have never been one to put my kids to the side and my money and my one day. I don't do the one day someday because I have been that girl that came close to you don't have another day. I think the other part of it is that my sister passed. Mm -hmm. And when my sister passed, it, it became very real. I saw that, you know, her children. Um, sorry, one second. They, um, they don't get the blessing 
of the mom that, you know, I got. My mom also has chronic illness, cancer three times, cancer while she was pregnant. She pushed through. She made it. She's been there for everything in my life. I love my mom. And my kids were a sense of, I can just make it to 12. I can just make it to their 16th birthday. I can just make it to 18. They allowed me these milestones. And as they got older, I started throwing in work and dreams. If I can just launch my own website, if I can just make it to coaching and helping other people. So people like my sister don't, you know, end up in the situation. I won't go into it that she was in that led to her death. Um, if I can just, you know, do these things that I get to do, uh, I can keep going. And I think that you have to find purpose. And that's the whole like pain into purpose, power into purpose, um, you know, mess into message, all those Pinterest quotes that we all use, words into wisdom, wounds into wisdom, broken becomes beautiful. All of those things, they play a role in that because sometimes when I don't want to stop, the memory of what she's missed out on comes right barreling in my face. And I'm reminded that some people won't get a chance to do the things that I can still do. It may be painful. It may be uncomfortable, but I can still do it. I will say that though, with the caveat that it's also another fine line. There's always the yin yang of things that I'm going to be pushing my body and I'm going to have to pay for it. And I also have to learn that I can't push too far because if I push too much, I won't be able to do anything for anyone. So I feel like I stand as an example of preventative healthcare, preventative self care, so that you don't have to react later and have to look back and go, man, I should have taken care of my health so that I'm not in that chronic illness state. So I would start at any age. I don't care how old you are. If you're in good health, doing that preventative health care, taking care of yourself, lowering your stress, and then finding your purpose now, trying to find your next thing to land on so that as you move into things, if you develop develop a chronic illness or whatever it is, you can weave it into what you're doing. So I could say that I just, I'm perceived as more busy, but like I said before, I live my life in seasons and I don't do it all at once. Mm. So if I'm really focused on coaching and building something with communities, then I ride that out for six to nine months. And then I might move into, okay, it's time for me to build a company that is a software for coaches and I've got investors. And then another season is me speaking. Um, I, I've been public speaking for the last 20 years. So I'm going to do a season for the summer of speaking and keynotes. And then, all right, all of those things have been done. I think it's time for me to do my book. I've been working on that in between these things. And now let me take three to four months to sit down and, you know, in between working, I will write the book and get that sent off. So you really just have to look at it as an art form of how you design your life. And that's really what I think it is. It's about designing your life, just like you do a living room with okay, the couch goes here because it makes sense. The TV goes across from the couch because that makes sense. So you can see it more clearly. It's easier for you. Um, We don't want glare on the TV. So we're not going to have the window over here and we put blinds up. So designing a life that allows you to live within it easily and to maneuver and to pivot when things don't go your way and to pivot when things don't work um, is great. And I think that you can do more with that when you have chronic illness because you're driven by some sort of purpose. And I'll end with this. I think some of us need it just for the placebo effect. We need to believe that we were given these struggles and these trials for something bigger. And I've always looked at it like, you know, if I die tomorrow, I may not, I may not find out if I, if it was, if it was a bigger purpose, but it won't matter because I won't be here. So, so, you know, while I'm here, I might as well just sort of trick myself into believing that it was all for a purpose anyway, so I can live a better life and I can be a better example for my kids and teach them to live in a world without me.
what you're saying about like the seasons working on something for six to nine months, it almost sounds like the way somebody with like ADHD might naturally do things. But the difference is, um, because I know I'm like this a bit, I will operate like that. And I think a lot of people do this, but the problem is it's like you do something for six to nine months and then you move on to something else. And the skill or the momentum that you built up with the project that you worked on for six to nine months falls off. And then if you go back to it, you're basically starting over each time. How do you prevent that from taking place? Yeah. So, you know, for one, like when I do a season, I make sure that I have a start and a finish to what I'm trying to achieve. So if I had to break, like writing my book, Tragic Magic, I broke that up into seasons. I'm always working. So the bottom level foundation is working. And then you're going to build these seasons on top of that. Mm. And for me, it was like, okay, there's a season going on right now of startups. And then there's a season that's going on of writing. So during that time period, setting a clear goal and a journey map. If you work in tech, you use journey maps and roadmaps. So setting a goal of, I want to make sure that I get my first, you know, 16 chapters or six chapters. And I want to make sure that I, I get those laid out and I want to like start getting the editing process done on that. So I can start to see how it's taking place so that I will be excited by the next time that time comes around. So setting up reward systems for yourself, I will get the editing process started toward the end of that season of writing the sixth chapter and then hand it off to an editor, you know, about like two or three weeks before I have to move on to another season and I've spread it out. And so they'll edit, you know, a couple chapters. And when they give it to me, I'm like, oh, this, this is so great. So I'm excited by the next time it comes around to really get down and get those next six chapters done. Mm. That's one way. The other thing is you're going to have to find magic in the mundane. You're going to have to picture yourself in what happens on the other side of the mundane. So when it feels boring and it feels like it's mundane and you are just doing things that you don't really want to do, you have to really take the time to give yourself that daydream. That's what we did as kids. If we're sitting in math class and we're like, I've learned algebra 15 times. I already know like equations. You would stare out the window and you would daydream about what it would be like, you know, to go to Disneyland or what it would be like when summer starts, which is a new season. And yeah. so giving yourself that joyful, youthful feeling so that, you're looking you're lo you're looking forward to coming back to something is important so if you're you know if the mundane is crept up on you and you're like ugh i don't want to have to sit and do you know all of these newsletters or make a bunch of podcasts that i've got to put out um because i'm i'm really tired just remembering and using gratitude like one Hey, reminding yourself, I am so grateful for the people I get to talk to. Like, imagine the imprint that you're putting on the world right now, Artie. You probably don't even, you probably don't even fathom how big it is. Doesn't matter if it's Oprah's level or not. The people that you have asked, like Joshua Busby, I've seen him on here. The people that you've asked to be on this podcast, you have forever become a part of them imprinting a little of their story or a lot of their story into society, into their family, into the world. And that is a beautiful thing to facilitate. Hmm. So it might get mundane. You might be asking questions that seem similar at times, but the stories that you are putting out and the value that you're giving your listeners will never be the same. No two stories are the same. So just finding that gratitude that I get to do this. Yeah. And finding that magic of the combined co-creation that you're doing right now aligned with, you know, just the gratitude that you've been able to offer somebody that opportunity to be seen when they may not have ever thought that they would be interviewed on a podcast. And then you've offered that yeah. to them and they're like, me? 
So staying in that gratitude, I think is just a really beautiful thing. And that brings more gratitude brings more of that same kind of thing. Um, now to end this on a more like exercise oriented way with the mind, um, it's really hard when you have a ADHD, you know, to not get caught up in it's a squirrel and that's fun. And let me do this. And let me do that. Yeah. You know, setting up a reward system is so important. So one of the things that I do is I set up something and I give myself, like, if I get this done, I get $20 to spend in the dollar section of target. And one might go, why not target? Well, Target is Target and I could buy whatever, you know, I could go get groceries or something anytime. But there's just something that, and a lot of women and men, you know what I'm talking about with the dollar section of Target. A lot of us know this. There's just something magical about another freaking notebook, you know, (laughs) that's $3 to prove that it's Target is $3 and it says my week, you know, and like, it's going to end up looking like that. I have another one. That holds pins and it looks janky. I've bought like 55 of these, you know, there's just something about some blue sunglasses that you're going to get. That's like, oh, wow, it matches my, you know, my bracelet that I have here. There's just something about like a, oh, I do plants and I bought this $3 propagation, you know, uh, vase that will make more plants. You know, there's just, those are the things that you can't plan for. Like if you ever want a surprise, Just, you know, you want to surprise yourself and shake it up and shake life up. Go to Japan, go to Bali. Some of you, but for those of you like me who can't do that, can't just jump on a plane and do that for health reasons, life reasons, whatever, just go to the target dollar section. Just go see whatever random, you know, glasses they have up, whatever, like mugs they have. This one's special. I told Artie earlier, it has, you're on mute and it's the exact one from Spaces. You know, like, but hair bows. I mean, what little girl that used to wear hair bows, like, is not excited to, like, get a $3 bow and, like, wear these again? So, yeah, just finding joy in things and giving yourself a reward system um, and doing it within, uh, you know, limits. So if it's food, just making sure that you're focused on things and then, if you have a cheat day or you have some day that you can give yourself um, like, oh, I can eat gluten or, or dairy today, you make sure that you make the most of it and you ask someone maybe to lunch. So you're kind of getting two birds with one stone situation, which is not a great analogy, but it's just the one that came to mind. But you're getting two situations for one. You're going to ask a friend to a restaurant that you don't usually get to go to because maybe you have a, a, a restricted diet due to health. But, oh, it's your cheat day. So you're going to go do that because it's a reward and you get to see your friend and you've infused two things together at that point and knocked it out of your week. So that's how you maximize joy, maximize your time. So when you said, you know, you're busy, I really look at collapsing time frames, which is, you know, Tia online says that a lot. And some other people say that collapsing time frames down so that you can stack them on top of each other. It's sort of just a life hack as I close here of like, um, when you're packing, I travel twice a month, sometimes once a month and I don't buy the fancy, like plastic bag that you put it in and, and like vacuum seal it. I just literally lay my clothes out flat and then I, I, and I put them in the bag, a trash bag and I use my vacuum cleaner because like, why buy a machine just for this? And then I just like flatten it. And I get the most out of it because it flattens it and it goes into my, um, my carry on. And then I don't have to do a checked bag because I can put my shoes in the space that would normally take for more clothes. Finding little hacks like that, that you can, you know, sort of self love, self life. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, it's interesting that the reality of death inspires you. I, I find death a really interesting topic. And I feel like it's, like you said, it's one that a lot of people feel uncomfortable with. I read a book. Oh, I that, used to. Yeah. The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Um, I really like that book. It opened my eyes it really? to it. Yeah. I haven't read it. It's uh, a woman that works in um, hospice mentioned it to me and I haven't read it. So yeah. I would, yeah, I'm going to write that down. But I, I'm very grateful for the podcast. I love talking to people. I love exploring different perspectives. And 
Uh, the podcast actually, you might have heard me say this before in spaces or something. I don't know if I've said it around you, but uh, death is a big part of the podcast. My dog died um, a little bit over a year ago uh, in April of last year. I'm sorry. And then I lost a job right at that time or left a job. And that was right after it. And it was like this, what am I going to do now? And, you know, I, I was faced with the possibility of, should I just get another job in tech or should I make a big change? And like, I'd, I've wanted to do the podcast for a while. I started it in 2020, but stopped. And I was like, I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to make, make it work, but this is what I'm going to do. This is what I want to do. And uh, yeah, it's just my little way of, you know, trying to make a better world in some way. But I know I mean, you definitely are. I got to see, you know, other podcasts that you've done and yeah. you can tell how special that's been for people. And um, I, I wrote down some of um, and uh, I'd go downstairs, but I'll do it another time. Maybe when we post it on X, I'll, I'll post some of the quotes that I took from some of the other podcasts that you did. I found yeah. them to be very inspirational. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, and I want to do more interviews. Like once I can put the system in place to do three or four interviews a week, I'll totally do it. Cause I, yeah. I mean, right now it's like, I'll get people and I'm like, I'm booked out until October maybe. And it's like, gosh, I want to, I want to invite more people. It's just, it's hard booking four or five months out because then it's, you know, people don't know their schedules in four months necessarily. So yeah, yeah, it's really hard in that sense, but I love it. and. Uh, I know you had uh, your cat, Cass, passed away uh, at one point. I'm sorry to bring it up, but I know no, I saw a post, amazing. Where, you, I appreciate I saw a post that. where you talked about it and you have another cat, Ollie, now. And we have Zoe, our cat, or no, our dog that we got. Can grab him? Yeah, yeah. I'll probably just say hi for a moment. He gets weird with the phones, but um, yeah. Hi, Ollie. Cute cat. Thank you. How long after Cass passed did you get Ollie? Um, I would say it was about eight months. Mm, okay. We weren't sure. Um, it was our first cat. We were dog people, and it was our first cat, and we were legitimately broken. It, you know, it was unexpected and I actually was on a space when I, I saw him and I found him mm, really? and, um, you know, I had, it was a great space, but I've, I, I had to delete it because you can hear me at the end. Um, and so I had to let that go cause I, I didn't want that out there, but, um, yeah, he, he was an interesting cat, the first one and, uh, what cats, both of them. Caspian, we called him baby, which we ended up finding out later. He was like an old man, which is so mm. funny, you know, like this old man cats running around and we keep calling him baby. So we like to just joke yeah. about it. Like he's like these damn people. Um, but, uh, he's, we got him young, you know, like he's like a toddler running around causing havoc. Like he'll just, you know, sit here like this and be like, whatever. <laughs> um, but, um, it's been great with chronic illness to have them. Caspian immediately took to me and I had a, a great, he was a blue Russian and he took to me cause I got a, a gray blanket that matched his fur and he saw me as the mom figure. And what I've learned, you know, having these cats is, you know, um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm just an emotional person. So, oh, yeah, yeah. uh, Caspian and, uh, this little guy, just taught me like love hurts. Yeah. Loving animals is just one of the most beautiful things that we can do. And the love that they give us back for some food and a couple cheap toys is so amazing. Um, and you never, you never know, you, you know that you're probably going to lose them. And you just don't know when. Um, but one of the things that I learned from that is when they're laying with you, being healing healers, or they're playing with funny things, or they're annoying you because they're, you know, fighting the plants. 
like he fights the plants, like they're <laughs> real, um, enemies. Um, and they annoy you. Doesn't matter. You're not focused on their death coming. You're not sitting and worrying about when it's going to come. You're not thinking about it. You're just in the moment of joy with them. And so when Caspian passed, it was so unexpected and it was so intense. But my daughter and I, we still walk around to this day. And when we think of something, we go, I'm so glad we did that. I'm so glad we did that. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that we we did that. I'm glad that we decided to take him on those travels. I'm glad that we got the backpack with the bubbles so he could see the world. I'm glad that he, we, we took him to lunch. We don't look back and go, I wonder if like we would have paid attention more. And if you ask with his heart, we don't do that. So I think from that, we've just learned to appreciate life and to not give the fear of death and losing life so much power um, when we just don't know when it's going to come. There's no possible way unless you have a terminal illness, of course. So why not take the lesson from animals and just be in the moment and be in the joy and write it out and, and don't focus on when it's going to come. You know, it's going to come, you know, that the animals are going to pass and we are going to pass, but animals, they, they, they don't think about when they're going to pass because they don't, they don't know that. Right. So they're out like, you know, he's running up and down the stairs acting crazy at 3 a.m. because he can, you know, yeah. and he's trying to like run out and capture the cat, the neighbor's cat. And I'm like, no, and doing weird stuff. And um, it's because he can. So I think if we, you know, take that lesson from animals that sometimes we just need to be bold enough to do something just because we can making sure that it's something that's good and, and is going to benefit, you know, ourselves and, and, and not hurt others. But um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of my sort of analogy for pets moment. Yeah. They, I feel like pets, um, I don't have any children. So, and I understand having children is different. I don't think having a pet is the same as having an animal because the expectation is completely different. An animal you basically expect that they're going to pass away in your lifetime. Most likely um, a kid you expect to outlive you, ideally, you know, and it's very tragic when that doesn't happen, of course. Um, but animals, specifically cats and dogs, they get to see us constantly. Like they were completely unfiltered around them. They're completely non-judgmental i think cats can be a little judgmental but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, but we, we, that's they what we it. joke about we talk this this little guy is goofy and weird he's just like he loves everybody lays it he's just a weirdo yeah. but um caspian was the side eye cat like the <laughs> and yeah. he would only be like super happy and like whatever when he was like give me my food peasants you know, like he, yeah. his name was Sir Caspian Oliver and he's Count um, Oliver Binks. So they both fit that. My daughter's into cosplay and Ren Fairs and all of that. So that's the names. But yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah. Pets are, there's, I, I've also, I've had dogs all my life as well. And, you know, um, had to rehome a dog that came from my, that I got the day of my sister's um, funeral. And we lived in Seattle and I had developed a brain infection and we were in a, an apartment and it was a great Pyrenees. And mm -hmm. I just, I, I think that more people should think about, is this right? Yeah. Like some people go, I just want that dog. But then they live in a tiny apartment and they can't go walk it and there's no big yard. And so my trade off with animals is that I will only get the animal that I know I can provide the best life for. Yeah, I'm I'm a big advocate of that same thing. I I've wanted dogs my whole life. Um I would get cats too, but Holly's allergic. Um but I've wanted dogs my whole life and I waited until I bought a house to get a dog because of that very reason because I've seen friends have to get rid of the dogs and it's always tragic because the dog doesn't know what's going on and it's not the dog's fault. It is it's the person's fault. Not yeah. to say they're a bad person or anything like that, but it is, it's just a matter of you weren't in the right place for the dog and you, or the cat, Absolutely. whatever it might be. So with Caspian, 
you said it happened unexpectedly. Was he just, he was fine and then just gone? Yeah. He, yeah, he was fine. Um, we didn't look too far into it. They told us that he had had congenital fart, heart failure. And I was hosting a space and I just got a feeling and he would always come lay with me and like sometimes try to knock the phone out of my hand. Like, no, like you need to give me your attention. Um, and just something reminded me like he hasn't been around to do that. And it'd been a couple hours and I got up and, you know, I was like looking for him and cat calling him. And, um, when animals know that they're passing, they go try to hide. And so, yeah. um, I guess he had tried to do that. So he had tried to hide under the bed in a place. And so I saw him and I knew immediately without, you know, graphics or anything. I knew immediately he was struggling. Um, I knew my daughter was going to struggle. And, and these are those moments that you, you have to like employ common sense and what's best for the, everything. So call my husband. Cause I don't drive. Um, I'm going to Uber Caspian. No, he's like, no, I'm five minutes away. No, you really don't understand. He's not okay. Babe, I'm sure he's okay. No, he's not okay. I can see him. I don't know what it is, but he's not making it. My daughter, I call her. I said, you need to leave your job. And I'm this, this is how impulsive and big a person I am for the people I love and the experiences that I know will change your life. And I tell my daughter, you need to leave. Well, I'm the only one here. Lock up and leave. Well, I can't because I'm the only one here. Lock up and leave. You, if, you, if you lose your job, we'll help you get another one. Okay. Um, I'm sending the Uber now. So she locks up. She gets in the Uber. She calls her boss. My mom said that I have to go to the vet. Um, Sinjin arrives. I put, you know, cat. The, the only thing I, I regret is not holding Caspian. I thought maybe having him in his carrier would be easier for him. And, um, if I would have known, yeah, I definitely would have held him um, sooner. But I, we drove to the, the hospital and just timing, you know, God's timing is interesting because we, or whatever a person believes, um, universe moment, moments, we got there and they said, you know, they always want to know about payment. You know, do you have $900 or whatever it is to make him comfortable? Sure whatever. And, um, you know, they send him, they take him back. I mean, I knew from their faces when they saw him that it was going to be over, but Mm. I didn't know how long. So I wanted him comfortable. Most people are like, I'm not paying $900 for that. And it's like, I understand if you can't, but we could. So I just decided, yes, I, I want his last moments to be good. Um, my daughter walked in right at that time. She got there. They led us to the back and I was calling my son. My son is the one that picked him. So um, he just so happened to be on his lunch break from work, like five minutes left. That was it. Five minutes later and he would have been, you know, off his phone. And I called and I said, Jaden, you know, Caspian is not going to make it. He's, he's, you know, we're at the vet. And what I love about Jade is he's similar to me instead of him going like, are you sure or what's happening or any of that? He understood. And he, and he was like, okay, mama, my daughter was fighting it. No, 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 no. Um, we'll pay whatever money. And I, and I had to just like Lou yeah. and we just moved through it. And, you know, it just, I just took one moment of just saying Lou and she kind of snapped into reality and she spoke. Sinjin spoke. Jaden spoke through the phone you could see that he was reacting. He was comfortable at that time. He was reacting to us. Um, and I spoke. And within a couple minutes, it was done. And they left us, you know, time with them. And I don't think I've seen any of us cry that hard other than when my sister passed. And, you know, the reason that this is so interesting, this space is, is because it was really hard to come back. Because my routine was I would get him, he would lay with me. He'd swat at the phone every now and then, but he would lay with me. 
and listen to the voices and certain voices he would do different things to. And, you know, I would talk about him and everybody knew Caspian, you know, your cat. And it took a while for me to be able to get back on spaces. It's so strange how cats and animals and people have that effect on us. But I just felt, I felt like it wasn't the same, but I was really happy that he had an impact on the world. Like I thought about it and I was like, this cat traveled all over with us and I made a, a, a Twitter page for him. And all of these thousands of people got to hear him meow next to me and talk in his own little way. So strangely, you know, I, I, I found that even, even cats have their own X spaces moments. <laughs> yeah. It, honestly, it does remind me a little bit about how bandit, I call him Dito. Uh, he died. Oh, I, had a, from, I had a dog named Bandit. Oh, really? Uh, he was a he was an amazing dog, and he just was off one day. One day I woke up, and he was just he, he was like kind of out of it. I seen my other dog kind of like that one tonight. He got out of it like a few hours later. So I was like, oh, it's nothing. Went about my day, and then later I'm like, okay, yeah, no, he's still acting weird, and Ended up taking him to the hospital, which, as you kind of touched on, like it's a going to an animal hospital when your animal is sick and potentially going to die is like it's just the worst atmosphere to be in because like you it feels cold and heartless because all they care it seem to care about is money and money. like what you can afford and you're like, well, I don't want to go broke but I want my animal to live like I care about him, you know? So it's, it's really hard in that sense, but yeah, he had a seizure there and then I brought him home later and they, uh, he died next to me. Mm. Mm. I'm happy he was home, but it was cause I wouldn't have wanted him to die in the hospital, but I, it's same thing. Like I wish I would have been cuddling him and not just letting him sleep next to me because it, that was my last chance to cuddle him. And um, what I really liked about the post I saw of yours about uh, Cassius and Ali is you mentioned like the time that you wait to get another animal is not like a reflection of your love for the animal that passed or anything like that. And it means a lot to me because I felt guilt over this. I loved, I still love Bandit, but I loved him tremendously. But the day that he died, I knew I was going to get another dog. Like, but I'm like, I don't want to be thinking about another dog, but I know I will. Yeah. It's like, it felt like almost betrayal to be thinking about that already, like to have that thought, but I couldn't, it's not like I, it wasn't a thought that I was like scheming to get another dog. It was just like, yeah, yeah I know I, and you know, we can have two dogs here. I'm going to have two dogs. And we got. Zoe, I think within two months of him passing, and it, it was like just, it was too quiet. Like I'm, I'm like, ever, I was just because I've never cried as much as when he died. And then it's yeah. the weird, it's the where I one time I broke down because of you get in this habit of these automatic things that you do. And I was like feeding. We just had Charlie for like two months, and like it was a few days after Bennett died. Holly was finally home because she was not there when she he died. Um, that was hard too because I had to experience her experiencing the loss when she got home. She knew he was gone, but like the realness, yeah, the realness of like going around your house and like you don't see him, you don't like he's not following me down the stairs or up the stairs, and I had to watch her go through that because I had already had to sit with that for several hours, and but then uh, one day I was feeding Charlie, we had the two bowls for their food and I just automatically put food in Bandit's bowl and I was just, I just broke down because it's like yeah. you're just it's a it's routine. Like you mentioned, it's like they're part of your routine, they're part of your everyday life. So yeah, I yeah. really appreciated your words on that because it means a lot. Thank you for sharing that story. That's super healing because I I really wanted a cat or a dog pretty soon after because of the healing and the void, but we were living in Airbnbs 
before we found where we were going to live. And we just couldn't, we couldn't choose one while we were doing that. So we had to wait longer. And, um, I just, I always wrestled with it, but yeah, no, thanks for sharing that story. It makes me feel like normal. And it also makes me feel like, uh, sharing those kinds of stories are important online. So you you never know who's going to listen. I'm not very good at posting or tweeting or, uh, doing anything in the feed. Um, audio spaces is more of my, my place. Um, so I always like when at least like one person every like six months (laughs) says something out about a post, I'm like, yes, I got, I got one person. If one person likes it, I'm like, that's so much better than like five years ago when I used to get zero likes on everything. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate you being open about Cass and Ollie too, because and and showing Ollie because it's really cool. I love people's yeah, animals. And he's right here everything. too. Like I thought he was gonna leave, but he's just sitting. <laughs> he's like laying right here. He's curled up. So I guess yeah. I, it's weird too, because when when we talk about Caspian and he's around, he just stays with us. It, I don't know if he just feels the feeling, but he's right here, right here on my lap, not moving, just right here. So kind of a beautiful yeah. moment. Well, and something I've had to process with getting Zoe is like, they're not a replacement and she was never meant to be a replacement for him. No. But they will remind you of certain things every once in a while. And it's like, every once in a while, I'll call Zoe. I actually called her Dito a few nights ago. We were in bed. I was tired and I was like, oh, is Dito? I mean, is Zoe, you know, like, and it's like, it's been over a year now and I still do it. So. Uh, yeah, we started yeah. calling this cat baby. Yeah, we call like we called Caspian baby, and now we call it this cat. We call it Ollie the baby. So it yeah. used to be baby with Caspian, and now it's the baby because he really is a baby. So I get yeah. it. Well, I know you have to get going pretty soon. Um, I, I do like to ask people that come on the podcast about books because I'm a big reader and I assume a lot of other people like reading too. So are there any books that you've found extremely influential? I know you said the war, war of art uh, earlier, which uh, that's actually on my list of books to read. I have a big old pile <laughs> that I have to yeah, get to. It, it's um, it's one that's um, easy to digest. So yeah. if you're like, I want to read something, but I don't want to get too heavy and too thick. Yeah. But for someone with ADHD, it's a great, great read. So yeah. Um, not saying you have ADHD. I don't know if you exactly said that, but, um, it's a great way of setting up uh, systems, but also from a creative standpoint, Stephen Pressfield wrote it you know, 50, 40 years ago or whatever. Um, but it applies to every, so many people have it on their list. Um, so that one, um, uh, I'm not going to d- go deep into it because everybody does. The alchemist is just a beautiful mm-hmm. story, right? Um, so I like that one. I mean, everybody puts that on their list, obviously. Um, the last five years, the subtle art of not giving it. And that one was just a knock in the face of like, we need to start seeing things differently. We need to go a different way. Like I really liked that. It humbled me because I was sort of an influencer at the time. And I was, you know, like I told you, uh, before the show that I was, you know, married to someone famous and, you know, doing things on TV, not doing things on TV, but on TV and doing things that people said this would be better. And I was like, no, I just need to do my own thing. And it was so refreshing in the midst of influencer land and all this stuff. I really felt like the subtle art of, um, you know, not, not caring is what we'll call it, um, was just a, a really refreshing one as of late. Um, a lot of the books, that are from the seventies and eighties around Zig Ziglar's and different people, um, you know, think and grow rich. If you're coming from a financial standpoint, you want to get financial literacy. You want to learn to be more financial liter- financially literate, which is something that I needed to do. I-, I love those books. I think absorbing different genres at a time is great. So what I like mm-hmm. to do is I'll read like something that's heavy in financial literacy, like think and grow rich. And then like, a werewolf book that's like a fiction book. Right. Um, yeah. so I, I also, and I, and uh, so I love that the wings of fire series, the young adult series, but I still love it. Um, my, my daughter got me into it. So I love that one. 
Um, and it's fiction all about dragons. So, uh, love that. And, you know, some other, some other, uh, books I would say, um, that, um, I've got a couple, I've got a couple here, um, that, well, there's, there's a couple here. Let me see which one, uh, that I, I really like, um, if I can get it out here, I don't have the name of the person right offhand it's called empathy, hmm. just literally empathy. Uh, it, it talks so much about empathy and why we should have it. The reason I love that one is in a world of so many crazy things going on. It's a really great reminder. I know some people would be like, there's a whole em- em- book on empathy. Is that for just like sociopaths? No, it really helps you understand the different needs and the different versions of empathy and, and, and how to utilize them and, and, you know, not to feel guilty and how to have grace and just so many different aspects of it. So, um, the, the book empathy itself, um, there's a lot of the, the greats, um, but broken open is one that I personally really found changed my life after divorce. Elizabeth Lesser wrote it. It was a uh, Oprah book club choice and she owns the Omega Institute where like Ram Dass and Rain, Wayne Dyer and a lot of manifestation and spiritual gurus as that word comes up again, um, taught. And I just, I love, uh, her and I love that book because Elizabeth Lesser isn't very like mainstream gimmicky. She's very like laid back and she just like, you know, stays out of the spotlight and then puts the book out. And so when she put that book out, it covered grief, it covered divorce, it covered affairs, it covered health, it covered aging, it covered parenting. And it covered it from like her going to visit shamans and, you know, tarot readers and Christians and different people kind of in the vein of eat, pray, love with Elizabeth Gilbert for people that like that kind of inspirational type of thing in that regard. Um, so I love that book. Um, for that, because it just has, you know, a really great, um, a really great, uh, way of every time you read it, you find something new. Uh, like I said, the financial ones are, are important. And then when it comes to manifestation, um, I really love the Joe Dispenza series. Um, I find if you get into the science of things, you're more like, like for me anyway, I like to get into the science of things. So you are this placebo and into, you know, supernatural, a lot of those books, a lot of that series, I won't go into all of them. I really got into those the last six years and um, really gained uh, a lot of different perspective on manifestation. That was more about neuroscience hmm. and just allowing the brain to be, and then, you know, intentionally visualizing. So I love yeah. that. And I guess last, um, uh, what would be like a last book that I would, that just comes out. I, I read about five books a, a a week, 20 a month. So it's tricky for me to choose, Yeah. but, um, mixing fiction with nonfiction is the way I go about, I would go about it. Um, but one is, one, one is the one that I read recently that I thought was, um, pretty fantastic. I think it was like an older, um, uh, are you book. reading one at a time or are you reading like five books at a time? So I will read, you know, the, the opposite. They're all different. So I'll read the fiction, the financial literacy, the, uh, like the fiction one that's like utopia is happy. Then I'll read one that's on like something scientific that I yeah. can understand. Um, history. I, I really like, like I read a whole, like two months. I learned about the gangs, um, from the mafia in Chicago. I just yeah. got obsessed with that. Right. <laughs> um, and read like 17 books on that. Um, literally 17 books from the library on that. Uh, because I just like to find the topic that's interesting and like know a lot about it and find the history and different perspectives. Um, yeah. uh, unlocking Lyme is one that I always tell people to read if they have Lyme disease, because that really, um, or, or chronic disease, it, it's not about Lyme disease. It fully, it's about, the terrain of the body and a lot of things that helped. I mean, I'm biased to it because my partner Sinjin edited it, but um, there was one that I, I just, I, I can't think I have it around here somewhere. I'll probably drop it um, in the notes on uh, X um, at some point. Um, when I started naming out the list of things, I just was like, Oh, um, cry the beloved country. Hmm. That was an Oprah book uh, list as well. 
that book, I really don't know, even know how to explain it. It, you know, it's, I was a young girl in Mississippi in the middle of the KKK and the Black Panther racial divide and growing up with, you know, part of a family that was like very racially just, ugh. and I don't talk to them. They're a step, my stepdad side of the family over there, some of them. And then my mom being so loving and accepting and everything. And we have a mixed family, you know, everybody's got different um, ethnicities and different things. But when I read cry, the beloved country, I just, I was like, that was when life just sank in that we do not choose who we are born, how we are born, where we are born. And life should not be better or worse for somebody. So I really loved that. And lastly, I knew I was thinking of it. Uh, Toni Morrison's love. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, T- Toni Morrison's, uh, is it uh, Sutra? I can't remember. What's it? Um, not Sutra. It starts with the S something. So Toni Morrison, I really, I really um, identify with that. And then just Guilty Pleasures, John Grisham books, because I grew up in Mississippi and they're all usually placed there. And the mm. audio books have the accent. So I think I probably covered all the ranges. You know, you could get into a lot of the modern day new age focused thinking books and all of that, but they're really just repackaged books from the seventies. So if you can't get those books, go to the library and, and just, you know, check out some of the books from the seventies on those same topics. And you'll find that you get the same things from them. Just remember that um, books are not, or whatever you're listening to self-improvement, you, your, your voice, your intuition should always be the loudest one that you're listening to other things, other books, and people's thoughts might be very helpful, but just, um, refining intuition is really important. And, um, you know, getting out of self-improvement, I'll end by saying this, I do an intox, which is an intake detox. So every nine to 12 months, I will not watch any self-improvement, uh, videos on YouTube. I will not listen to podcasts. I will not read books of that nature of self-improvement for two months. And I will just cleanse the brain of all the opinions and all the things you should be doing. And I'll just read, you know, dystopian books and, um, you know, fun, uh, like, you know, um, rom-com type books and things like that to cleanse the palate of the brain to do a reset so that I can implement what I'm learning, implement what I've been studying instead of just intaking all the time. And I think that's one of the things that I would like to leave when it comes to books, podcast, anything spiritual, anything self-improvement, we tend to take on everything, right? It's the fear of missing out. So we've got FOMO when everybody's reading every book and they are like top 100 books and you got to cross them off the list and you got to read all of them. Yeah. But people forget to implement what they're reading along the way. So Just as much as the bucket list of crossing the books off your viewer list is important, I would say so is implementing the things that you've learned every six to nine months, trying it, see if it works. And if it doesn't, moving on to the other things. And that's worked out great for me. Awesome. I love it. Uh, Thank you for sharing all that. Um, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, Before we wrap up, I want to just hand it over to you to share with listeners where they can find you, where they can... uh, if they want to work with you or, or learn more about you, anything else you want to share as well? Yeah. Um, this has been, you know, an amazing time. Honestly, it's been a really crazy couple of weeks with my health and different things. Um, so usually podcasts are just a, li- a lot for me, but, uh, thank you for the, the very grounded and just, you know, authentic, honest answers and questions and sharing your, of yourself um, as well. For me, you can find me uh, on most platforms under Dear Kimberly K. I don't do TikTok. So I would say on X, I do Feel Good Friday. Um, it's just a way to give back uh, coaching tips and thoughts and mindset and sharing of stories and letting people come up and, you know, be the star for a moment and shine. Um, we're bringing that back. We've been bringing that back every Friday, other than this one, because I had to, to do my treatment. Um, so I'll be there doing that one. Uh, Instagram is a place where I document 
nothing exciting or fun. We, we're launching my professional one. I've got an, a professional one. If you want to follow that one, it's Kimberly K. Scott. But Dear Kimberly K. is the one that you'll probably just, you know, want to just hang out with me and see what life is like. And then um, my website will be relaunching. It'll be Kimberly, uh, Dear Kimberly K. or Kimberly K. Scott. They'll both, you know, both will um, go to the same place. That's mm-hmm. going to be relaunching in a couple weeks. Uh, but in order to work with me or anything like that, here's what I would say. And even just following or engaging, um, I am a, I am, you know, a very fast evolving person in some ways, and then also kind of lazy evolving in others. And I would take the advice that I mentioned earlier in seasons as your approach to me as well. I might be your person for a season. And I might be your person, you might be Antarctica and that season might be for a long time. Or I might be your person for a season of like, you know, just a couple months or a couple years. And um, I'm okay with that. So if you, you know, come to find that my content or what I'm doing just doesn't fit your vibe anymore, I welcome you. I invite you to disconnect that connection so that our energy stays clear and The other thing that I would like to end by saying is um, I don't like to use the word follow, but if you would like to be, you know, online, uh, like in an online tribe or community, then I welcome you to the Dear Kimberly K arena of spaces, um, whether it be photos or it be uh, on Facebook, Instagram or X. And then lastly, um, just want to, you know, say this. The point of social media is to connect. Um, so for me, you probably won't really see me selling much until I get to my book. The so Tragic Magic will be out the end of this year, early into the next 2025, somewhere along there. That will probably be the only thing that I sell and push out. Everything else, um, just my mantra in the mornings, and I'll leave you guys with that, is that I ask every morning you know, and my prayer and my mantra is that God send me the right people at the right time, the right opportunities, and the discernment for me to know that it's meant for me. So if you cross my path, it's probably likely that you were sent at the right time for the right, you know, reason and the right season. And uh, we leave the rest up to whatever happens at that point. So I hope to see anyone around. And if you uh, came from Artie's podcast, just drop me a, a DM in uh, my inbox so that I can share that feedback with him and let him know that you came from listening here. Just go that little extra mile so that he can know where his listeners are coming from and he can know who was listening to this and took that extra step. So if you heard from this podcast, just drop me an inbox and just, uh, even if you just write the word Artie, that's all. That, that way I can share it with him and we can keep the joy flowing between everybody. Awesome. And thanks for so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Kimberly, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and FractalZoo.net, which is where I have unique Fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on x at RDTM Podcast and Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.